the the title of my portion or the title of this this uh, this talk that we're doing is properties and characteristics of wood and if you think about it with the hundreds of trees there are in this country and the thousands of trees there are worldwide and all the wood that we import it's very difficult to talk about the properties and characteristics of wood when they all differ so while I'm going to talk about some properties and characteristics, I'm also going to explain where I get that information and how it helps me be a better turner. I guess to start, uh, we're a unique breed. Uh, we, we, I, th I think we're taken for granted by other people and that they don't appreciate nor understand what we do. But like a, a painter or a potter or somebody who works with wood, uh, even though we're called crafters, we are artists in our own way. And just like they need to know what their medium is that they're using and understand it so they're better at what they do, I think we need to know our medium so we're better at what we do. So the more we know, the more I know, the better I'm going to be. So my approach is to understand the wood that I'm using. And every time I come up with a different wood, I want to understand what the characteristics of that particular wood is. And it helps me with all the steps of turning from drying and, 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 and starting and rough turning all the way to the finishing. So I start with knowing how a tree grows. And if you've never taken the time to really sit down and read some information about how a tree grows, this will tell you a lot about the medium that, that we use. You know, for example, when somebody gives me a, a, a chunk of wood, the first thing I do is I look at the pith. And if the pith is off center, most of the time, I know that that comes from a limb. And I also know from understanding the tree that limbs have different wood than trunks. They've got two kinds of wood that the trunk doesn't have called uh, compression wood and tension wood. One's on each side of the pith. And this wood will move far more than the trunk moves. So I know that if I've got limb wood, I don't want to tr turn a platter out of it because a platter will never sit flat. I don't want to turn anything that has a lid on it with a tight fitting lid. If it's a loose fitting, that's okay. But tight fit, it'll, it'll, it won't last. It, uh, it, it will go out of round. For, for hollow forms, I try to avoid hollow forms with limb wood because I try to keep a concentric roundness to my, my hollow form. And a hollow form, unlike a lot of else, what we turn has the pith in it. And on a limb, you've got compression wood on one side and, 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 uh, and uh, tension wood on the other side. So it's not gonna hold its shape. So I, I like to know about the tree. Uh, another example is if I wanna turn something a natural edge and keep the bark on, I know that I need to cut, I need to use winter cut wood. Um, that's because, not to get technical, but there's a cambia layer between the bark and the, and the sapwood. And when a tree hibernates, it dries up and it grabs a hold of, of both the bark and the sapwood, and it will stay there until it starts running again. So that's what's going to hold the bark on. So understanding a tree uh, helps me be a better turner. Another example is shrinkage. I know that wood shrinks in three different directions. But I also, and each tree shrinks at different amounts. But I also know that in one particular tree, or many trees really, in one of the directions, the sapwood will shrink 20 times as much as the, as the heartwood. So if I've got a little bit of sapwood in the side of my bowl, it's going to twist. If I got it in the bottom, it's going to cup. And if I got it in the top rim, if it's concentric, nothing is going to happen to it. So it's understanding the shrinkage of the tree. Um, little things you learn about about you know studying the wood for example any tree that produces fruit any tree and I've, i i was sitting down trying to write down how many different fruit trees have i turned i i came up with a dozen or so anything that any tree that produces fruit cracks so you've got to treat it different dry it different cure it different um it, it's just a different animal in itself uh it's not stable wood but it's absolutely beautiful wood so knowing the tree and how it grows in the different parts of the wood and knowing where your wood is coming from will tell you the properties of the wood. Now there's a wood, a, 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 it, a, a, there's an email that I, or excuse me, a, a website that I use. I've been using it for about 15 years. Probably many of you have already heard of it. It's called wood-database.com. The dash is very important. So wood-database.com. 
And if you go to wooddatabase.com you will and look up your wood, you will learn more about the wood than you ever wanted to know. And it tells me everything I need to know, including whether I'm being shucked and jived by a retailer. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I was looking, I went down to Woodcraft the other day to see if they had any woods that I had not turned yet. And I came up with one, it was called Macacaba, M-A-C-A-C-A-U-B-A. -A -A and Macacaba, um, so I started looking it up. Well, years ago, uh, and maybe even today, Woodcraft sells uh, orange agate. And I, I really liked orange agate because it polished nice. It had a nice orangey red color. It was great for Christmas decorations. And then they had a wood called Hormigo, H-O-R-M-I-G-O, -O, come out. And I turned a little bit of that. It was similar to orange agate, but it's, it had two different Hormigos because of the different colors of the wood. Well, in researching Macacaba, Macacaba, orange agate, and Hormigo is the same tree. They use Macacaba when they want to refer to the wood of the tree. They use orange agate when they want to sell the wood of the tree. And if they want special people like turners and, and musical instrument makers, instrument makers to buy their wood, they use Ormigo. But if I set three different billets, one of each of, of Macacaba, orange agate and Ormigo, and I want to treat myself to three new kinds of wood, I've just bought the same wood three different times. <coughs> the wood database website gives me that information. Now in the wood database, I, I look at two things in wood. And this is, that gives, this is what gives me a lot of the properties of wood. First is the specific gravity. And I'm not going to get technical here. Specific gravity is nothing more than the density of the wood. It compares the density of the wood to the same amount of water. So if I have a two by two by 12 billet of water, and a two by two billet of wood, it can be compared. Water is 1.0, it's neutral. So any number different from that differs from water. So if, uh, if I do a comparison, I compare hard maple to poplar. <coughs> the specific gravity of hard maple, and by the way, in reading hard maple on the, uh, the wooddatabase.com, hard maple is sugar maple. It's also known as rock maple. It's only one tree, grows in the northeastern part of the country. It's, it does sneak down into, into Virginia a little bit. All the other woods, all the other maples, silver maple, red maple, uh, big leaf maple, box elder, which is a maple, they are all included in soft maple. And they give you a specific gravity of a range in a range. So hard maple has a specific gravity of 71. Poplar has a specific gravity of 46. Now, what does this tell me? First of all, it tells me that poplar is lighter than, than hard maple. It's going to float higher in the water. It's also going to tell me that poplar or that, uh, that maple will polish much, much higher with uh, finer grits of sandpaper. But it tells me poplar will take more stain because it's a lower specific gravity. Poplar will also take a deeper wood burning. Maple takes fewer coats to finish. And poplar is a dustier wood to turn. So I get all of that, the properties of the wood, out of the wooddatabase.com when I look at the specific gravity. The other number that I look at at wooddatabase.com is called the Jenka hardness. Again, we're not going to get technical here. This is nothing more than how many pounds of pressure does it take a steel ball to dent the wood. It's the hardness of the wood. And the hardness of the wood tells me the difficulty of sanding the wood. So the higher the Jenkin number, the harder it is to sand. If I've got uh, tool marks in a high Jenka numbered wood, I know that I have to start with a lower grit sandpaper to get the tool marks out there. That if I start with the grit that I typically use, all I'll do is go through sandpaper and get frustrated. I need to do something more coarse because the wood is harder. It also tells me the strength of the wood. So if I want to turn something that's structural, if I want to turn a carving mallet, if I want to turn a children's toy, I look at the woods that I have in my shop and I look at the Jenkin numbers and I want the hardest ones because I'd rather make a mallet out of hard maple than I would poplar or hard maple than out of, I may not look cherry and walnut, they may look nice and pretty, but they won't last anywhere near as long as hard maple because they will dent much easier. 
give you an example. We'll use hard maple and poplar again. Hard maple has a Jenka rating of 1,450. Poplar has a Jenka rating of 540. So 1,450 to 540, which one should I use as the mallet? Which one should I use as a structural piece that I'm turning? It's very easy. So knowing your woods, if you go to wooddatabase.com, and again, there's a dash in there, and that's important, wood-database.com, it'll tell you everything. It'll tell you the origin of the wood. Uh, it'll tell you how big the tree grows. It'll tell you everything. So my personal objective always has been to turn as many species as I can. Um, if you read my bio, I, I turned every species of wood that came into woodcraft over 16 years. So I've turned a lot of, uh, of wood species. My favorite wood though is fresh apple. That's not apple that's been cut and stored, it's fresh apple. I like fresh apple because it's easy to cut. It, it's friendly on the tool sharpness. I like the color, it finishes well. And apples like cherry, it steepens with age. So it gets prettier as it sits on the table. If you've never turned fresh apple, it's kind of like holly with color or um, let's see, uh, olive wood with no oil. It's gonna be the same thing, but it grows a fruit. So it's gonna crack. I have to be careful of that wood and I have to treat it a little bit different. The other two favorites that I have, I like ambrosia maple and blackwood. Uh, ambrosia maple, I like it because it's just a very pretty wood. I like the contrast, it's fun to turn. And actually over the years, I've learned how to change the color of, uh, of, of ambrosia maple. So I can create some very beautiful ambrosia maple. I've got one piece in my shop that's 14 inches in diameter, 30 inches long. It's been, it's been kind of developing for two years and I have an objective of turning it this, this winter and it will be beautiful. And I like black wood because of detail. I enjoy turning finials. I typically use black wood. When I made sure I left, uh, when I left Woodcraft, I made sure that I had a lifetime supply of uh, a black wood. I'll never run out of black wood and no, I will not sell any of it. Um, my least favorite is red oak. I don't like red oak because I don't want the tannin in there. I don't care for the black lay, the rusting lay, the dirty hands. Uh, it's a pretty wood that tends to crack. It's just not fun for me. And I don't like Osage orange. I don't like Osage orange because the longer it, it, you're removed from the actual cut time, the harder it gets. And then that nice orange color that you expose turns a very ugly brown over time. So I just, I just don't enjoy uh, turning Osage orange. So in conclusion, I, I could give you, give you a few recommendations. First of all, learn your wood while you're changing its shape. Study it, look at the shavings, watch what it does, watch how it reacts, look at the grain. Two, understand the wood's position from the tree, whether it's a crotch or a burl or a, or a, a trunk or a limb. Where is it coming from? Because it will react differently and you'll know the reaction if you understand how a tree grows. Three, use the wooddatabase.com frequently. It's, and again, that dash is very important between wood and database. And finally, don't be afraid to turn anything. Um, if you haven't turned a laminated construction beam where they take a bunch of chips and glue them together, you can't get it very thin, but it makes a beautiful bowl. Um, if, you, if you laminate plywood together, plywood makes a gorgeous, um, a gorgeous piece. And speaking of lamination and plywood, if you ever go to a, uh, um, a, 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 a craft show, or not a craft show, but a, a garage sale or something like that, and you find an old broken airplane propeller that's been laminated, made of laminated wood, makes drop dead gorgeous pieces, an old, old propeller. If you haven't turned a tagwa nut, the, the poor man's ivory, Turn up Togwana. So finally, I guess what I want to say before I end is, in my opinion, experience is the product of failure. And uh, I, think, I think we all share that we're probably pretty experienced in what we do because we've all had enough failures. But to me, the expert or expertise is the, common, is the combination of, of uh, experience and additional knowledge. And that's what I'm going after is the expertise. So know the tree, use the website, turn anything. And uh, I believe that we are artists and we work with a very fascinating medium, but I can't give you the products or the properties of each and every one out there. 
Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to the next presenter.